Water rights, an argument against dams on the Brahmaputra River. The nature of a river is that it flows. This flow can carve stone, power, and create new land with the salt it carries. In the case of global climate change, increasing demand for resources, concern over the renewability and environmental impact of, tr of traditional coal power, nature energy has been embraced as almost universally beneficial. However, in reality, the transient nature of rivers can present environmental and political objections for dams, hydroenergy, and extensive upstream irrigation. Focused on the situation around the Brahmaputra River, also known as the Yong Tsangpo in Tibet, which starts high in the Tibetan Plateau and descends through China and India, finally reaching, reaching Bangladesh where it flows to the sea. China and India both want to take advantage of its enormous flow, filled by seasonal melt in the Himal Himalayas, monsoons in India to provide power, irrigation, and fresh water for growing populations. However, Bangladesh, a small agricultural nation with 160 million inhabitants packed onto its fertile land, depends on the salt carried from far upstream to nourish its crops and the water to irrigate its fields and to support freshwater fishing. I believe that although building hydropower dams along the river would give a low CO2 source of valuable power, the effect they would have on the river's flow into Bangladesh is severe enough to demand that India and China look elsewhere for energy solutions. Already, the initial amount of damming on the Brahmaputra has led to increased salinity of the land as seawater encroaches on the, the large, delicate delta ecosystem. The governments of China and India don't particularly seem to care about the ways in which their actions concern Bangladesh. They both have massive economies, strong governments, and substantial international political clout, Bangladesh's weakly de developed democracy and lack of political connections. Bangladesh does not have the bargaining power or organization needed to negotiate with them. This issue calls not so much for political responsibility, as the people most affected are in a different country, but for moral responsibility, as any upstream would lead to a loss of sediment flow and loss of flooding that would devastate Bangladeshi agriculture and create a human rights crisis. Arendt would argue that China and India have a responsibility for their actions and how their actions affect others. And even if the citizens did not get a direct say in the matter, they are still collectively responsible for those consequences because of their membership in the state. In fact, more than 50 social and environmental non-governmental organizations in northeastern India have sent petitions to the Indian and Chinese governments asking them to cease dam projects on the river. They point to the number of villages and ecosystems that would be destroyed by water filling the reservoirs behind the dams, the damage that would be done to Bangladesh, and also the conflict that the dam projects would be likely to spark, and have already sparked, between the two nations as reasons to explore options other than dams. According to the vacuum proviso, as explained by Nozick, in order to, for the situation to be just, China and Indian, India would have to use the river in a way that left an equal possible result for others. When someone controls the other, only source of a necessary resource, he says, it would be immoral for them to hoard it or charge an extravagant price for it. In this way, since the upstream countries control the flow of sediment and water, it isn't just for them to deprive Bangladesh of that right. It doesn't matter that they could derive electric power from it, since there are multiple ways of creating electricity, but only one future river. The public in this case is linked together by the river. As Dewey remarked, a public springs from the fact that all types of associative behavior may have consequences beyond the actors originally engaged in them, as well as the realization that they face a common problem. It's also useful to think of a rent statement that the public is defined by being the only entity capable of challenging governments, like the Indian NGOs are doing. Out of all the dam projects on the river, the Poster Child is a gigantic dam China is currently building on the Great Bend of the Yolong Sangpo, a location that would price double the, the power of the Three Gorges Dam on the Yangtze River. It denies such plans in response to questions from India and Bangladesh, and does not allow foreign experts access to the area or their plans but the project has been confirmed by other correspondents and by satellite photography. This project does not only carry environmental or social weight, it is also highly political. The Great Bend runs uncomfortably close to Arunachal Pradesh, a province administered by India but claimed by China. China hopes to use this massive investment in the area to assert its sovereignty. This secretive approach perpetuates the feelings of mistrust and competition between China and India. I believe that a greater exchange of information could lead to a less hostile environment around this issue. 
has plenty of room for expertise. For example, ge ge geologists and environmental engineers to assess the project areas for risk, monitor, monitor patterns of flooding, and assess silt and water level, and analysts and sociologists to gather their opinions and suggestions of the local people and interpret how their needs would be best served.